to you this morning to just give you thanks first of all. Thank you Father for watching over us last night and waking us up to the rise of a new day. Father we thank you for all the spiritual blessings that we enjoy in this life through your son Jesus Christ. And we thank you Father this morning for the opportunity to come together even though it's digitally to worship and to give you praise this morning. Father God, may the things that we say and do be acceptable into your sight and through what we give you this morning that you will receive all the glory and the honor. Bless us as we go into this worship experience. It is in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. Thank you. 
in the fullness of your grace and in the power of your name you lift you lift me up you lift me up oh lord you lift me up in the fullness of singing in the fullness of Psalms, the 63rd division. Psalms 63rd, and we're going to read this morning verses 1 through 8. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Most gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We are humbled and thankful that you've allowed us this time and this space to worship you this day and praise you this hour and the fellowship that we have with you and each other through that dear Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We are thankful for just bountifully blessing us, allowing us to see the light of this day. We ask that you will continue to keep us in thy love through this time of worship, and as we go through the days, weeks, and months ahead, if it be thy will. We ask that you will continue to bless our health, and we ask a special blessing for the health of those who are hampered by physical illness and emotional despair. We ask that you would bless thy word that is surely to be brought before us. We ask that you will bless it in such a way that it may bless and edify your church, that it may stir someone's heart who may need to be restored, that it may stir the heart of someone who knows not your son, that they may turn their life anew and their life over to Christ. Continue to guide us through this day and this time of worship unto you. It is this we ask in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen.
There is beyond the edge of blue. Yes, our God cuts you from human side. He takes disguise with heavenly you and break the worlds with his great mind. Yes, there is a God. There is a God
family and friends. I want to take this moment to welcome you to this digital worship space of the Church of Christ at Northside, located in Detroit, Michigan. To our visitors, we are just so glad that you have joined us this morning and you are our honored guest even here in the digital realm. And it's our prayer this morning that your being with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying and that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being here today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities, whether in the digital or in the physical realms of the Church of Christ at Northside. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you can. If God has been good to us this week, God has been good to us every moment of our lives, matter of fact. He has blessed us. He has showered his grace and his mercy and his love on us. He has given us our health and our right minds, the use of our uh, physical faculties. And if you ever want evidence of that fact that God is good, just consider that for at least one more time, you are on this side of the timeline of life and you are being seen and not being viewed. I'm going to ask that you will pray with me and then we'll go into our lesson for this morning. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we come before you right now, thankful hearts, just so appreciative of all that you've done for us and all that you are to us and all that you've allowed us to be in and through your son, Christ Jesus. Father God, we're so thankful for all of our blessings that you so bountifully give us each and every moment of our lives. Father, whether they be our physical blessings, whether they are material blessings, whether they are health blessings, whether they're financial blessings, and especially, Father, our spiritual blessings. Father God, right now we pray for all of those who have assembled in this digital space to hear a word and to praise your name. Father God, we pray that their hearts are all open, that their minds are all receptive to what we find in your word, that they may live out your word, Father, and it will glorify you by the way that they live. And right now, Father, I pray that you will hide me behind the cross as I strive to give a word to your people. Father, help me to understand that it's not my word, but your words that need to be heard. And it's not my will, but your will that needs to be done. That through all of our efforts, you may be glorified and you will receive all of the honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray right now. Amen. This morning, I'm going to ask that you will join me in the 63rd division of the Psalms. Psalms, the 63rd division. Psalms 63rd. And we're going to read this morning verses 1 through 8. Psalms. Division 63, beginning at verse number one and reading through verse number eight, the Bible says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings 
will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Question this morning. Have you ever really gone hard after something in your life? Was there ever something that you wanted in life almost more than life itself? It could have been a new job or a promotion. It could have been a new spot on the starting team. It could have been a young man or a young lady that you really were interested in. It could have been a car that you always wanted. It could have been a, a contract that could make or break your company. It could be a, a, a fitness goal or a weight loss goal. And what did you give to get what you wanted? Most people, when they want something like that, they give it their all. They focus their energies on it. They think about it day and night. They devise a plan or a strategy to get it. They talk about it to anybody who would listen to them. And they stick with it until they get it. We all have those types of pursuits in life. They're what we live for. They make life worthwhile, so we think. They provide drive and they give us a sense of purpose and accomplishment. But I want to ask the question this morning, what would happen if we gave that same type of effort to going hard after God. What would happen to us as individuals? What would happen to us as families? What would happen to us as a church if we made this type of all-out effort to pursue God until we really found Him? What kind of changes would such a pursuit make in our lives, in our prayer lives, in our priorities, in our use of time, in our spending habits, in our social life, in our church attendance, in our burden for the lost, in our missions commitment. And this morning, I can't help but believe that it will literally turn our lives and our homes and our communities upside down for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you where I'm coming from in talking about this today. Each and every one of us have been enjoying the blessings and enjoying the presence of God in our lives. God has met with us in a powerful way, even through this COVID pandemic. But I can't help but feel that there is still something more, something deeper, something higher, something wider, something longer that God has for us as an individual and as a church. And I'm not sure I can define it anymore, specifically than, than just that. I just know it's out there, and I want it, and I hope you want it as well. And the second thing that runs concurrent with that one in my heart is the strong feeling that we must do more to reach out to the lost, to children, to youth, to the down and out, as well as the up and out. And I have to ask this question this morning as I think about those things. What does it mean to go hard after God? Well, here in the 63rd Psalm, 
we find an explanation of what it means to go hard after God. And it goes along with an instructional manual on how to go about it. David here, who's the author of this particular psalm, sets forth three requirements or, or conditions, and they can be summed up in three words. First of all, the first word is reference. In order to go hard after God, we have to have a reference. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? Simply this. We have to know where we are. We have to know where we are. Look at verse 1 again. David says this, real simple. O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry land and thirsty land where no water is. Did you hear that? David says that his soul and his flesh is in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. In order to realize that you need to go hard after God and to go hard after him, you have to recognize where you are. It's told a story about an absent-minded professor who became so absorbed in his work that he forgot the simplest of details. One morning, his wife said to him, Now, honey, remember, we're moving today, and I'm going to put this note in your pocket. Don't forget. The day passed by, and the man came home to his house. He entered the front door, and he found the place empty. And distraught, he walked out to the curb and sat down. A young boy walked up to him and he asked him, Little boy, do you know the people who used to live here? And the boy replied, Sure, Dad. Mom told me you would forget. Well, that sounds funny. A lot of times we forget where we are. And the superscription at the beginning of this psalm, if you got one of those good Bibles, will tell you the setting in which David writes this psalm. He says when he was in the desert of Judah, David realized too well where he was in a desert place in a wilderness, and he describes it in verse 1 and as a dry and weary land where there is no water. Understand this this morning. Going hard after God often begins with an accurate point of reference. Until we recognize just how dry and weary of soul we are, we will never take steps to do something to correct that situation. One thing you can say about David is this. He was not troubled with mirages. He didn't look over that dry landscape and mistakenly see an oasis. He knew the situation for what it was, a dry, weary, waterless land. thing that you need to realize this morning is this. Most Christians are in a desert place spiritually. They don't even know it, though. It's like they live in a world of mirages. They accept as facts things that are just a figment of their imagination. They see things that aren't there. They believe things about themselves that just aren't true. And they are like that church uh, uh, described by Jesus in, in Revelations 3 and 17, that church at Laodicea. 
where he says, and, and this is from the message translation, you brag, I am rich, I got it made. I don't need anything from anyone. Oblivious that in fact that you're a pitiful, blind, beggar, threadbare, and homeless. Maybe sometimes we as a church contribute to that false perception. See, because God's presence is in our service and because people can freely enter into praise and worship, they might assume that everything is just fine. And it's time that we let the Holy Spirit call us to account so that we can be reminded of just how dry and weary and pitiful we really are. Look around you. Is everything bright and green and growing and reproducing? If not, you're in a dry place. Our souls finding God are sinners forsaking their sins and turning back to God, our lives being truly changed by the power of the Spirit. If not, it may mean that you're really in a dry and weary land. We have to understand reference. We have to know where we are. But David gives us a second thing that we need to know. David says in order to deal with this this dry land and going hard after God, you have to understand resource. You have to understand God as your only hope. Look at verse one again. He says, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I want you to notice the first words that came out of his mouth here. Oh God, thou art my God. Oh God, thou art my God. And if that statement is true about you as it was about David, that ought to by itself bring some hope into your heart told us uh, another story about a woman uh, uh, and, and the phone rang one day and she answers. The voice on the other end says, honey, it's mom. And I called because I know that you're busy with three children and I want to give you some help. I'm going to stop by to clean the house, take care of the kids and prepare dinner for when the boys get home from school. I want you to get ready to go to my beautician. I paid her already, and she's going to give you the works. Your appointment is at one o'clock. Give your husband, George, a call at the office and tell him you'll meet him at Shea J's for dinner on me. The young mother interrupts suddenly and asks, George, who's George? The caller says, uh, George is your husband. My husband's name is Fred, she replies. The woman on the other end of the call says, is this 555-3212? She says, no, this is 555-2212. And the caller says, I'm sorry, I have the wrong number. And after a pause, the young mother sheepishly asks, does this mean you're not coming over? Two things stand out to me. When I think about that statement and when I think about David's uh, call out, oh God, thou art my God, and that's this. David <coughs> acknowledges the presence of God, number one. He realizes that God is there even in this spiritual wilderness. Psalmist writes in uh, the 139th Psalm this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. 
David recognized even in this barren wilderness spiritually that God's presence is there. Look at also what David does in that, that short statement. David acknowledges God as my God. Oh God, thou art my God. David here lays personal claim to God as his rightful ruler and owner. He is <clears throat> by covenant and consent. This is where we have to go next in our pursuit after God. We have to acknowledge him as our only hope, <clears throat> as our only resource. We're not going to find our way out of this wilderness, this dry place without help. We may have gotten here by ourselves, but we're not going to get out of it by ourselves. We need help. We need God's help and God's help alone to get out of this mess. Psalmist again writes in Psalms 18 and 6, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him in his ears. And it will take a deliberate act of repenting and turning back to God. It, will, it can't be a quick, casual genuflect at the altar, but it has to be a true pursuit of God as our only hope. We have to deal with reference. We have to know where we are. We have to deal with resource. We have to see God as our only help. But David here in this first verse also gives us a third thing. In our going hard after God, catch this, there has to be resolution. We have to set our hearts to seek God. Look at David again in verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. Listen to that again. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. First of all, I want you to notice what he says about the importance of his pursuit. Here he says, early will I seek thee. Now, the idea here is not necessarily the time of day. Although the early hours are a great time to seek the Lord, but what he's saying when he says, early will I seek thee, he is making this seeking the priority in his life. Get that this morning. If we're really going to go hard after God, if we're really going to seek God the way we're supposed to, Seeking him has to be priority number one. It can't be something that's left to the waning hours of the day. It can't be something that we do once we spend our energy on any and everything else. It can't be a, a, a leftover thought that we have before we go to bed. But it's something that has to be done as the first priority in our lives. Secondly, I want you to notice what he said about the earnestness of this pursuit. In another translation, this verse reads this way. Earnestly I seek you. In my heart I long for you. My whole being desires you. I can't get enough of you. And he uses two illustrations that he knows his listeners will understand in trying to demonstrate just how serious he is about going hard after God. He says, first of all, that he feels like somebody who's dying of thirst. 
Verse number one, he says, my soul thirsteth for you. My whole flesh longeth for you in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Have you ever been so thirsty that you felt like you were going to die if you didn't get something to drink? David understood this reality very clearly. He grew up in this desert region. He knew absolutely how essential it was to have a dependable source of water. That's why he said, my whole body longs for you. Every cell in my body cries out to you to be refreshed. I can't live without you. And the question you have to ask yourself is this. Have you ever been this serious about your pursuit of God? Has going hard after God become as important to us as water is to somebody who's dying of thirst? Maybe if you're not going hard after God, you have to realize maybe you just ain't thirsty yet. Because if you're spiritually thirsty, you would understand the situation and you would understand how desperately you need God. But then he uses another illustration. And then he uses an illustration of somebody who's starving to death. Just as the human body cannot continue to function without taking in food to nourish and replenish it, David says he cannot function spiritually without feeding on God's bread from heaven. Dan, have you ever been so hungry you just didn't feel like you could go on until you got something to eat. Jesus said it this way over in Matthew 5 and verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled or satisfied. I like the way it reads in the TLB translation. Happy are they who just long to be good. For they shall be completely satisfied. Have you ever come to your place? Here's another question. Have you ever come to a place in your pursuit of God where you can say, as Jesus said to his disciples in John 4 and 34, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Can you say that? Has your hunger for God and his will Become like the very bread you eat. Maybe you haven't gotten hungry enough yet. But I want you to see David just doesn't leave it there. David leaves us with some results of going hard after God. He shares with us what will happen if we really start pursuing God the way God wants us to pursue him. First of all, there will be a display of his power and glory. Look at verse 2. David says this, to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary. To see thee in thy power and glory. So as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary. David says this. Once we begin a renewed pursuit after God, we will immediately begin to see his power and his glory displayed in our lives as never before. If you long to see God work in your life, if you long to see God work in your family, if you long to see God work in the church, the secret is going hard after him as an individual, as, and as a collective. When God shows up in your life and in your services, things will start to happen. 
And I can tell you as a matter of fact, the world outside the four walls of the church are desperate for a display of God's power and glory. And most of them won't take the time to come inside just to see us doing church. But they will come to see God at work among us. Reminded by the, uh, of a statement by the great preacher John Wesley, who said the reason why people came to see him by the thousands to hear him preach was because each time I set myself on fire, they came to watch me burn. And we ought to have that same mindset that God will help us do whatever it takes to set ourselves ablaze for him. But not only does David say we will see a display of his power and his glory, David also lets us know that there will be an inner satisfaction of soul. Look at verse 5. David says, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Y'all remember all that hunger and the thirsting that David mentions in verse number one, all the dryness and all the weariness. Well, apparently it looks like that problem was solved for David because when he says in verse five, my soul shall be satisfied is with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. As we began to draw to nearer to God, he responds by satisfying the inner longings of our soul. Psalmist says it like this in the 107th Psalm in verse number nine. He satisfies those who are thirsty. It fills the hungry with good things. Psalms 103 and verse 5 puts it this way. He fills my life with good things so that I stay young and strong as an eagle. And I want to ask you this question this morning. Don't you just long to feel the inner craving for more of God? Don't you get tired at times of going through the motion spiritually? Here's the answer to that question. Go hard after God because he and he alone will satisfy the inner longing of your soul with himself. But he gives us a third thing here. And that is going hard after God will give us freedom from fear. Look at verses six and seven. He says, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Another blessing of going hard after God is that we don't have to fear anything anymore. You can lay down and sleep at night because you know God will keep watch over you. Psalmist again puts it like this in Psalms 4 and verse number 8. When I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. David here in, in, in the seventh verse says that you can sing, you can praise in the shadows because he's your help and he will be there with you. There is no safer place in the world than to be in hot pursuit after God. But he gives us a fourth and final thing here. Going hard after God will provide you a new freedom in praise and worship to him. David writes this in verses 3 and 4. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. 
I will lift up my hands in thy name. You see, as David's heart is worn by a new awareness of God's love for him, his lips and his heart and his hands were freed up to praise and to worship him. And as God moves in new power among us, we will respond in new freedom or with new freedom in praise as never before. Now, I know that I've said a lot this morning about going hard after God, but I want you to realize as we close out this morning that a message like that will produce one of three responses. There's one group who will say, well, preacher, don't get yourself all worked up. Don't rock the boat. We like it the way it is. So don't expect anything different from us. That second group will say, preacher, that sounds good. I can see that it could really make a difference. And I hope somebody gets on board with you. But I know from experience that something like that calls for a lot of work. And I just can't get involved in that right now. But there's fortunately a third group who says, this is just what we need. This is what I need. And I want it whatever it takes. Because I really want to go hard in my pursuit after God. And the question that I want to ask you this morning simply is this. Which group are you in this morning? Are you ready to go hard after God? Or are you satisfied with your level of commitment right now? What will it take for you to move to a new level of commitment? Are you willing to pay the price are you willing to commit or recommit to what God wants you to be and what God wants you to do in and with and through your life? Maybe you've lived a life that was short in the things of God. And, and understand me this morning. You're not in a place by yourself. All of us have been there at one point or another. And if you think you haven't, just keep living. And you will find yourself in that dry and in that thirsty land where no water is in your spiritual life. But for those who are honest and are willing to recognize that that's where they are right now, God welcomes you to come back to him. God wants you to come after him. And if you are just willing to come after him, God is faithful to forgive and to restore whatever your shortcoming was. He will count it against you no more and, and reconnect you back to him. Maybe you've never made a commitment to God in your life. And, and if you've never uh, uh, found yourself in a place where you need to make a commitment to him, let's understand something this morning. He long time ago, made a commitment to you. Romans 5 and verse 8 tells us this, for God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Catch this this morning. God didn't wait for you to come hard after him, for him to go hard after you. He showed his love towards you in such a mighty way that while you were still in sin, Jesus Christ died for you. And I just got to ask the question this morning. If someone was willing to die for you, wouldn't you be willing to live for them? If someone was willing to die for you, Shouldn't you be willing to live for them? You can live for God right now. You can dedicate your life to him right now. You've heard his word. You heard how he came and how he died for your sins. 
It is as simple as, first of all, believing that word. Simply that Jesus came, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day for your sins. That's the encapsulated message of the gospel right there. That he came, that he died, he was buried, and he rose again in the third day with all power in his hands for your sins. Let it secondly lead you to repentance. And that's just simply turning away from the things of yours, turning away from the things of the world and turning toward God and going after him. It's a change of mind that simply leads to a change of focus and a change of direction. Thirdly, let it lead you to confess that Jesus Christ indeed is the son of God. And fourthly, let it lead you to the waters of baptism where your sins are all washed away, where you come in contact with his blood and you arise from that baptism, a new creation and living life faithful. One day heaven will be yours and you will see God in peace for all eternity one day on the other side of the timeline of life. What's your need this morning? What's your desire this morning? If it's prayer, we'll pray with you. If it's being restored, we'll aid you on that restoration journey. If it's being baptized for the remission of your sins, we will make that happen for you this morning. All we ask you to do is just to reach out to us at the contact information that appears on your screen whether it's the email address or the phone number. And if you reach out to us, we will immediately make your need happen. We will make whatever it is a reality. We will pray with you. We will help you uh, in your restoration with, with God. And we will baptize you if that's the need immediately this morning. If you reach out to us, we can reach out to you. What's your desire? Just let it be known by using that contact information that's on your screen right now. The message is yours, and I'm hoping someone was encouraged and edified by God's word this morning. And at this time, we're going to turn the services back over to those who are uh, in charge of facilitating them further. And as we close this part of the service, just remember that God loves you. And we at the Church of Christ at Northside do as well. Sweet, I know. of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had a sup saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me for as oft as as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as you allowed us once again to approach your throne of grace, we ask, Father, that our minds be fixed upon Christ and all that he has done for us. We ask, Father, that as we take these symbols of his shed blood and broken body, we do so with the proper heart. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11.
morning in this digital worship space to bring you glory and honor. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the things that we've said and done be pleasing into thy sight, and if not, we ask your forgiveness. And Father God, we ask your blessings continued upon us as we walk day by day, trying to give you glory through our lives and through our actions. Father, bless us right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen.
This ends our worship service online broadcast for today. We thank you for tuning in, and again, we hope that you were blessed in some way by joining us. We invite you each and every Sunday at 1030 a.m., as well as our other weekday Bible study and prayer broadcast that are scheduled during this time. We continue to pray for your health and safety. We are located at 18460 Conant Avenue in the city of Detroit. Be blessed.